Welcome to our Flip Friday vodcast for the 18th of November. We're going to be meeting in STEM um, tomorrow if you're watching this vodcast on Thursday. Uh, if not, then you're watching it on Friday and hopefully you are getting all set to submit your homework number eight because yes, that is due today, this Friday. So remember to get that all submitted. Also remember to make forward progress on your poster presentations. If you have received feedback from me, which a number of you have, please go ahead and turn that around and send me a finalized version of your abstracts. I would additionally love to receive poster drafts as they become possible for you to make. I know that that might take a while for some groups, but for other groups it may be accessible right away. Feel free to send those my way as they do get done. Today and Monday are flip days, so I say today if you're watching this on Friday the 18th, um, then today is our, our STEM day, we'll meet in the STEM foyer. And on Monday, we're going to flip, but we're going to play a game in the regular classroom. So we will meet there for a lot of action and a lot of um, beneficial action on Monday. Also in lab, don't forget your skill test, your OWLs, you'll want to get those done. I want to jump in because when we left off last time, we were totally getting down with some antibiotic action. And we had been talking about those antibiotics that target structures such as the bacterial ribosome or the bacterial cell wall. And I actually have with me a model that one of the students um, built, actually it was one of the student poster groups a while back. You might actually recognize the genus and species name on this, Clostridium difficile. This is actually a bacterium that is incredibly notorious because it causes antibiotic acquired diarrhea. It's the number one cause of that. And uh, sadly, it is not responsive to most antibiotics, about 10% responsiveness to antibiotics. So we, we had talked last time about, hey, you could prescribe an antibiotic to target the cell wall. We talked about the beta-lactams. We talked about vancomycin and such. We additionally talked about why not prescribe an antibiotic that targets the 70S ribosome. We talked about the macrolides, the aminoglycosides, the tetracyclines. But today I want to finish our conversation by saying, you know, every bacterium has to package its DNA, so why not target DNA packaging? So the set of antibiotics that we'll begin our conversation with today are called the quinolones, and quinolones do target the supercoiling of DNA. So you might realize that that means that they're very broad in spectrum. So the fact that they uh, can hit the overall packaging of DNA makes them a uh, efficacious against a wide range of diseases. So whether you're talking about a uh, food infection that was bacterial acquired, or whether you're looking at a respiratory infection or an STD, um, there are so many bacteria that will be responsive to the quinolones. They're very broad in spectrum. So ranging from E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Neisseria, uh, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus, and even Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is certainly the talk of the hour because it is really raging through uh, populations of people who are immunocompromised. And right now we have so much antibiotic resistance in tuberculosis that even the quinolones are not effective against most of our tuberculosis strains that are multi, multiple, multi-drug resistant or extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. But let's give an example of the quinolones, and this includes things like Cipro. Uh, Cipro is what it's called for short, but its long name or full name is ciprofloxacin. And it might be that Stephen recognizes this. The other day you had told me that um, in the military you uh, had been exposed to certain antibiotics as preventatives. A lot of times with Cipro, you'll get prescribed this before you leave to a foreign country. And then if you get any one of these broad spectrum diseases caused by any number of bacteria, you can actually self-medicate. Now we could have a long, very in-depth conversation about whether that prophylactic well, it's not really prophylactic. It's, it, it is kind of in that you're being prescribed it ahead of time and then the doctor is putting trust in you that you'll take it at the right times for a bacterial infection and not for a viral infection. So that's laced with controversy in and of itself. But I will tell you a story. Uh, when I was in China, I spent some time in China way back in 2003 
And I actually was visiting family that were teaching English in China, and they were there for a long period of time. They had been given the Cipro before they went and ended up having to take it, and it was very needed. It was a necessity at the time. It was a very uh, grave bacterial infection. So it's such a hard conversation because uh, Cipro, taking it with you is such a... Um, feeling of safety if you know you may not be able to get medical care in whatever country you're visiting. But on the flip side, is it the right kind of use of antibiotics? So it's just a, a great discussion. But in any case, uh, inhibits DNA topoisomer, he says, and the supercoiling of DNA. The last one that we want to hit on, and I think probably all of you are realizing that we got to the two ingredients in Neosporin last time. So remember that we had visited Bacitracin, which is one that's in the triple the topical ointment, the triple antibiotic ointment uh, that, that uh, would be in, you know, that we sometimes call neosporin. And so um, if we recognize that neosporin does contain both neomycin, bacitracin, or said another way, antibiotics that target the cell wall or peptidoglycan synthesis, bacitracin, versus neomycin that we know targets the um, small ribosomal subunit of the bacterial ribosome, the 70S ribosome. Now that's the two ingredients of the three, and our very last ingredient, and um, I'm trying to remember who it was, maybe Rob that came up the other day with polymyxin. So polymyxin is the third ingredient. So in this triple antibiotic ointment, this targets membranes. You can see why all of the three of these, but particularly this third one, have very low therapeutic indices. They're not selectively toxic at all. They're not things you would want to eat or take orally, but they are very common in the topical creams. So polymyxin B binds to membranes of gram-negative cells and causes a leaky membrane. So that is obviously not something that would be particularly helpful for uh, our bodies if we were to take them ori orally, but they are usable on, on topical surfaces. So there we have it, the triple antibiotic POW that comes with that surface cream that we sometimes put on cuts. Uh, and, and interestingly, we often use that prophylactically. So another really interesting discussion to be had, so many of them. I want to ask you a question before we leave antibiotics completely behind. This question just has to do with the cell wall structure and how it relates, of course, to which antibiotics we choose, and then likewise how it relates to how easy, how easily we can target a cell or how difficult it becomes to target a cell. And I think you'll remember quite readily that gram-negative cells, and actually, let me grab a model because I have so many. Quite an artistic model. This is the gram-negative cell here, and of course our upside down gram-negative cell here, and then our gram-positive. And when we ask the question of, in general, which type of cell is it easy, easier to kill or inhibit with antibiotics? Well, of course, the gram-positive, because it has an outer exposed peptidoglycan layer. It's easy for us to get to a structure that is found in bacterial cells that is not found in us. So in general, it is easier to target gram-positives than gram-negatives, particularly with the outer membrane being um, a membranous structure that also we see in human cells. It's harder to get something that uniquely targets gram-negative bacteria. Well, now, we say that really broadly because we also know that gram-positives have likewise developed the ability to make um, resistant factors and, and carry often those R plasmids which with multiple resistances. So assuming that we're not dealing with resistances, we can state that gram-negative cells are often more protected from chemotherapeutics versus those gram-positive cells. It's also interesting to ponder the fact that it's always much easier for us to kill and inhibit bacteria than it is to kill or inhibit eukaryotic infectious agents. So when you get a fungal infection, it's much harder to treat that because fungal cells look more like our cells. And the same could be said of trying to treat viral infections. Although viruses don't necessarily resemble our cells more, in some ways they might, um, but 
they live in and usurp our own cells. So when they are basically becoming a part of us, it's very difficult to, to selectively target those. And that is a wonderful segue into our conversation that comes next, and that is viruses. So this may be my favorite section of all of our coverage, and I want to kick things off with something that many of you are going to enjoy um, that is just historical. So we want to look at a timeline, but I think there are so many intricacies in this timeline that excite me. One of the first is that it tells the story of people who are not necessarily um, noteworthy scientists, and it gives credence to the fact that they were making some of the first and most novel contributions to the world of virology. So if we rewind historically our calendar and go all the way back to um, the, the late 1600s, the early, very early 18th century, Lady Wortley Montagu was the, um, she was married to the English ambassador to Turkey. So she had traveled to Turkey with her husband and she was very observant. Now, this observation probably stemmed in personal background, having dealt with smallpox on a very personal level. She had horrible scars from smallpox and her brother actually had died. And so she was watching the local um, Turkish women. They were literally vaccinating their children against smallpox. And so when Lady Wortley Montague came back from Turkey, she tried to spread the word of vaccination. And of course, her claims landed on mostly deaf ears and nothing really happened. It wasn't until 1798, almost 100 years later, that Edward Jenner finally was astute enough to pay attention to the claims of a little girl. This little girl was a, she was a ranch girl, so I mean, Emily, you're gonna, like, this is gonna resonate with you and so many others, um, but this little girl said, hey, Mr. Jenner, uh, we have had cowpox, so we don't get smallpox. Edward Jenner paid attention, and he realized that for the very first time, he could vaccinate against smallpox by giving people a, a, a case of the cowpox, and it worked. So this was sort of the inception of vaccination. But what's interesting was at this time, and you all know this because you can trace on this calendar as well, on this timeline, think about where the um, germ theory of disease finally came about, as we didn't understand that bacteria were causing disease. Well, we definitely didn't understand the difference between viruses and bacteria. And in fact, the term virus, it just is Latin for poison or venom. And we didn't really understand what was what. And so it wasn't until 1884 that a man named Charles Chamberlain came on the scene. And he, inv he invented this porcelain filter that allowed him to, um, for the first time, separate bacteria and viruses and really start to get this feel that there were two separate infectious agents. There were the ones that got caught on the filter and stopped in their tracks, and there was the viruses that passed on through. So he was working actually with a plant virus called tobacco mosaic virus. Now, about 1908, there were two um, Scandinavian researchers, uh, Olaf Bang and Wilhelm Ellerman. <laughs> so who's Scandinavian? By the way, did I say it's snowing? It is so beautiful outside right now. Um, so there, the Scandinavians would love to know that it was snowing too. And these two researchers, they were working with chickens, actually. They were looking at malignancies on chickens, and they were able to realize that it was viruses that were contributing to these malignancies. So this was the inception of this idea of um, viral oncogenes, that is, that viruses could lead to cancer. You all are actually very familiar with this, and we're super jazzed to have Clara's group be working on the project that will be looking at a human papillomavirus. They'll be presenting that at the poster session. And HPV, we now understand, causes upwards of 90% of all cases of cervical cancer. So we understand that human papillomavirus is what is contributing the oncogenes there. So, so interesting stuff. Now, it was in 1915 that bacteriophage were discovered, so the viruses that attack bacteria. And then it, it wasn't until 1935, with the work of Wendell Stanley, that he actually crystallized tobacco mosaic virus, and he observed that it was largely made of protein. So now we start to realize, oh, these are definitely really different structurally than other infectious agents. 
And we're starting to get this idea that viruses are really very unique and um, certainly uh, amongst the most unique and we still can't decide, we're still debating whether or not there should be room for them to be called alive. Now that takes us to our next slide because for all of my career as a microbiology teacher, I have told students that despite my eagerness to debate the concept, most people categorize viruses as non-living. They call them acellular agents. And that's not because they're obligate intracellular parasites. Remember that being an obligate intracellular parasite means that they can't replicate if they're not inside a host cell. So that's true, but there are bacteria like Rickettsia rickettsii that can't do that either. So it's not that alone that causes us to call them non-living. One thing that does seem to cause us to call them non-living is the fact that they don't have both types of nucleic acids. So they don't have both DNA and RNA. And that has convinced most researchers to say that this is not, they're not validly living. However, just last year, there was an article published that showed the conservation of protein folds and argued that therefore maybe we should reconsider whether we consider any viruses living or not. So tough to, to at this point give you a discerning answer on that, but to say that we should debate it at any time. Let's talk size just a little bit, right? Let's face it, size matters. And in the viral world, it certainly varies a lot. We can go all the way down to something like the tiny little parvovirus, which is a little baby naked virus. It's itsy bitsy, as compared to something like the pox viruses that are much, much larger. So the sizes range from 10, uh, very tiny 10, to like 300 and 400 nanometers. That's like, you know, well over a tenfold difference in size. Um, and yet, it makes them still very small compared to bacterial cells. I, I had another fifth grade group I talked to this morning, and they were, they were so cute, but they were um, trying to wrap their minds around the size difference between a virus and a bacterium. Most viruses are, are tons smaller, like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than the cells that they infect. So if we picture a um, T4 bacteriophage, it's like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than an E. coli cell. If we picture a, a human virus, uh, like the influenza virus, which by the way, I have a sweet model of the influenza virus. This was built by one of my students in a past semester. And you can see that she is showing influenza in all of its grandeur. Well, this would be like 10 to, or like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than the lung cells, the respiratory cells that it infects in us. So there's a, a vast range of sizes, ranging, you know, e even more than, than tenfold from little tiny parvoviruses all the way up to large pox viruses. And there are even larger viruses than the pox virus. And in fact, it's some of those large viruses that have caused people to maybe reconsider some of the um, life form barriers that we put on things. We need to talk a little bit about the morphology of viruses, and there's sort of two basic forms that we think about. There's an icosahedral form, which quite literally is an icosahedron, 20 equilateral triangles. And the proteins that make up the icosahedron of the protein coat, or capsid, is what we call that outer layer. They are made up of um, the proteins themselves are hexamers or pentamers, depending on whether they're on a vertex or not. The ones on the vertices are pentamers, the ones on the flat surfaces are hexamers. So it's a really geometric form. And it turns out that if you really want to build a house that gives you the most space for the amount of land that you have, you would build an icosahedral house because it is the most efficient way to enclose space. So the most nucleic acid can fit in that um, for the amount of space. Now, many, many viruses also have on their surface a spike. Um, wait, <laughs> let me say it this way. Multiple spikes. Here I'm showing one spike. And these spikes are what adsorb to the surface of a host cell. So they um, have on them the proteins that recognize the receptors on a host cell. So together, we could say that the um, capsid and the nucleic acids that it contains is called the nucleocapsid. Not very creative, but certainly very descriptive. 
And an example of an icosahedral virus, though there are many, um, is poliovirus. The other thing that fits into the same group, actually the same family as poliovirus, is the rhinovirus, which is the regular old um, cold. Like when you get a cold, that's a rhinovirus. So both of those are naked. <laughs> what I mean by that is that they don't have an outer membrane surrounding the nucleocapsid. There are many viruses that do have an outer phospholipid bilayer, a membrane, an actual membrane that surrounds them. And you can think about where they get that, because they're clever, they're super smooth criminals. But some of them do have that outer membrane. But naked viruses don't. That's by very definition, they don't have that. So icosahedrons are one form that the virion might take, but the other is a helical form, meaning that essentially they're the protomers, the proteins that make it up, actually wrap around in a helix, and then they enclose a certain amount of nucleic acid. So a good example is the one that Wendell Stanley was working with, tobacco mosaic virus. That is um, the plant virus. Now let's look at these enveloped viruses and envelope by there can be helical envelope viruses and icosahedral envelope viruses. Here we're showing an icosahedral enveloped virus that isn't just an outer membrane that comes along with the virus. And hopefully you thought about my question, where would that come from? And hopefully you were thinking, man, I bet that virus totally usurps it from the host cell. That's exactly what it does. This is part of the reason that it also makes viruses hard to treat because they look like us. They take, envelope viruses take our membrane. They have an outer appearance that for most intensive purposes looks like us. Super smooth criminals. <laughs> so it's tough to treat them because of that. Now there's a lot of examples of enveloped icosahedral viruses. One of the most famous is herpes virus, um, but there are others. Um, obviously West Nile virus fits into this category, um, so there are many famous ones that, that are considered icosahedral enveloped. We'll talk about more soon. Complex viruses we've already met because, in fact, a bacteriophage is complex because it's neither icosahedral nor helical. It kind of had components that were outside of that. Remember, it had the sheath and the tail fibers and the base plate and the tail pins and all of that. It was complex. Another virus that fits really nicely into this is the smallpox virus or the pox viridae in general um, because they notice in that earlier picture that we were looking at, they don't really have either an icosahedral or a helical form. So those are good examples. So these are the overarching morphologies of viruses, but let's zoom in and talk about their nucleic acids. Because really the heart of a virus is the nucleic acids. And what's interesting is that viruses actually come in multiple forms. That is, while we know they don't contain um, both DNA and RNA, they'll have either DNA or RNA. And so we can get uh, um, four different types of viruses. We can have double-stranded DNA viruses. That seems pretty common, right? We often think of DNA as being double-stranded, but guess what? There are also single-stranded DNA viruses. There are single-stranded RNA viruses, which makes quite a bit of sense. But then there are also double-stranded RNA viruses. And now, this, is, this seems much uh, less average, doesn't it? So one could certainly say with all accuracy that single-stranded RNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses are by far the most common. But the others do exist. So most DNA viruses use double-stranded DNA. Most RNA viruses use single-stranded RNA. And it's cool to think about the different types of single-stranded RNA that we could get because you could see an RNA that was a 5' prime to 3' prime polarity, and that is considered a positive sense RNA virus, it, virus. So sometimes we will simply call this a plus SS RNA virus. So maybe identical to the mRNA, and that's called the positive sense 
And guess what? Sometimes viruses are so clever that they'll even have a phi prime cap and a poly A tail on their plus sense RNA so that they look even more like the host cell that they're infecting. Now, there's some good examples of this. Um, poliovirus is a good example of a positive sense RNA virus. Now, there are other viruses that are negative sense. Influenza virus is a negative sense RNA virus, meaning that it instead travels 3 prime to 5 prime. So, Obviously, in, in being this um, sort of negative direction, whereas a virus that has a 5 prime to 3 prime positive sense RNA, in some cases, this can get used directly as an mRNA. That wouldn't happen in a negative sense virus. It would, of course, have to undergo the process of serving as the template to make um, a 5 prime to 3 prime strand. And then from there, that might be able to be used as um, mRNA. And in fact, most RNA viruses, this double-stranded RNA form is the replicated form. This is the form that allows them to make more. So you can see how that blue strand, the positive sense, could now be used to make more of the negative sense to package into daughter viruses. So this is cool to think about that. Now, you might have noticed when I showed you the image of the um, influenza virus, that when you look at the nucleic acids in there, you might recognize that there's more than one strand. So influenza virus is a segmented RNA virus. It actually will have seven or eight separate RNA strands. And that actually gives it a capacity that is kind of scary. It can do something called reassortment. Because what we could see is that uh, the RNAs could come from different sources. Like one RNA could come, if, 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 one, if one person, for example, got infected with a swine flu and a bird flu at the same time, then within that person, new viruses could form that would have strands from swine flu and strands from bird flu and maybe strands from human flu altogether. So these are called segmented viruses. So segmented viruses, such as the influenza virus, have several molecules of RNA carrying different genetic information. And that is a really interesting characteristic of viruses like that. Now there's some additional terminology that we'll just take a moment to look at. Let's clear out our, all of our drawings here. And I did... Um, I did give you some examples. I didn't necessarily write those down. Polio is a positive sense RNA. And then we talked a little bit about influenza being negative sense, but so are rabies and measles are also good examples of negative sense viruses. So there's just a lot of diversity within the um, viral world. And in fact, this morning I was thinking about um, the need to characterize the human virome. You know, we talk about the microbiome a lot, which is our bacterial populations. But what about our viral population. Pretty cool to think about. So some terminology. Um, the replication of viral nucleic acids is sustained by expression of different sets of genes. So in any viral genome, there are genes that are expressed right away when the virus's DNA gets or RNA gets into the cell. And then there are genes that get expressed much later. We call the um, the first set, the early genes, really makes sense, right? So the early genes are the ones that get expressed right away. And you might guess that those have to do with the replication of the nucleic acid. Because the first thing that a virus wants to do, obviously, the first thing influenza wants to do is make more of its genome. And then once it's made a lot more of its negative sense RNA, then it can go ahead and say, all right, now I can make my capsid, right, my uh, outer layers, and I can package that DNA in there, and then I can bud off of the cell and get my outer 
uh, envelope. So this, this actually is showing the outer envelope with the spikes on the outer envelope. So there's a series of things that take place. First, the replication of the genome, then the making of the protein code, you know, and then all of that can get transported into the virus um, and out of the cell. It's cool because we actually call viruses different things depending upon whether they're in the cell or out of the cell. And if it's out of the cell and it's just dormant, out of the cell, non-replicative, we call it a virion. So the virion is the metabolically inert form. And it's cool to think how viruses have remained metabolically inert for long, long periods of time. And a good example of that is, is actually hantavirus. Hantavirus will crop up in different places around the world. Like there would be, there was an outbreak in Europe and then, you know, decade, you know, 100 years later probably, um, I can't remember exact dates, there was an outbreak in Argentina and then, you know, quite a long time later there's an outbreak in the Four Corners area. So it will be at, dormant as a virion in between, though the, the mouse, the, the deer mouse is a carrier and that's, that's a confounding issue. But um, they can sit dormant for very long periods of time, hundreds of years. So when the virus is inside the cell, then of course it's in its replicative form and it's very actively replicating because it can do so when it's in the host. So these are all, all things to think about as we consider the viral world. And I want you to ponder that because it certainly brings together concepts that cross all of our coverage as we learned about um, not only me metabolism, but also gene expression. And so we can look forward to our Friday flip day going into more depth on that.